he was hyperventilating and was on the phone and said I'm on the phone with 911 the neighbor's house is on fire and from there I kind of grabbed the ladder and started to run across the street I think this was definitely the hardest call I've ever been on it's difficult to process something like this when I was in the hospital and I just so desperately wanted to get home to my family and it wasn't even a decision it was just like I'm gonna do whatever it takes to get out of this bed Good evening, and welcome to a celebration of courage. I'm Nancy Wertin. You are about to meet some true heroes, people who in the face of a raging fire, silence their own fears to allow their adrenaline to carry someone else to safety. Some of these folks are firefighters who have enthusiastically trained for this moment, but others are just people who found themselves in the wrong place at just the right time. The Valley Preferred Spirit of Courage Awards are presented annually by the Burn Prevention Network in conjunction with Valley Preferred and Lehigh Valley Health Network. As a television news journalist, I've seen the horror that fire can inflict and the conviction of firefighters and first responders. My dad was a New York City firefighter in an elite rescue squad called Rescue One. I grew up knowing if there was a fire in Midtown Manhattan, people would be running out but my dad would be running in. As a family, we breathed in the pride on Medal Day and held our breath when the phone calls came that my dad was taken to the hospital. Tonight, we are a collective family gathering to recognize and applaud incredible bravery and a mindset that puts the needs of others before our own. The Spirit of Courage Awards program is made possible by Valley Preferred providing innovative programs to improve healthcare delivery, Lehigh Valley Health Network, and other generous sponsors and donors. You can find the full list at burnprevention.org. On October 18th, we celebrated our first live Spirit of Courage event since 2019. Each year we are in awe of what our honorees accomplish and the courage they display as they go about what they usually refer to as just doing their job. It takes a special kind of courage to emerge from a burn injury and rebuild your life. Our patients show incredible strength and perseverance as they learn to navigate in a changed world. Thank you from the bottom of my heart to all of you because the funds raised tonight go to support Camp Susquehanna and you are truly making a difference in so many lives. We presented 28 awards to incredibly deserving people. We don't have time to tell all of their stories tonight, but we invite you to visit the Burn Prevention Network website to view all of these amazing stories. The Spirit of Courage Award is presented to people who have risked their lives to save someone from a fire. And here is one of those stories. Ben Steininger called upon his Eagle Scout mantra, Be Brave, as he was about to enter a house on fire. His courage, clear-headed thinking, and tenacity saved three generations of one family, as well as the family dog. It was just a normal, I wouldn't say normal, but a normal day in the 911 center. We were taking calls, and then your father called, and it was just a single call. Obviously, you know you don't live in a closed-in area, you live in a pretty rural area, so it's not like everybody's calling at once, it was that one phone call. It was short, sweet, to the point, my neighbor's house is on fire, okay, do you know if there's anybody in trap? I don't know, um, I don't think anybody's home, I think he said he didn't see a car in the driveway, I forget the exact wording. Um, and then I hung up with him, and then I think about five to ten seconds later, after I hung up with him, um, my other dispatcher, Megan, took a phone call from Tessa saying, I'm trapped in the fire, she gave the address, and then we realized, oh, that's the person I just hung up with, so I quick redialed back, because my thought at that point was, there's nobody else around, he sees what I don't see on the outside and what they can't see, and he's able to tell us what's going on. And then my thought process started to change at that point as, there's no way for them to get out, because they had one door. Um, at that point, I was like, okay, we need some sort of ladder. I thought my dad, something was happening to my yeah. dad, right? Because I don't hear my dad scream my name for no good reason. Yeah. And I came outside and he was holding the ladder and he was hyperventilating and he was on the phone and said, I'm on the phone with 911, the neighbor's house is on fire. And from there, I kind of grabbed the ladder and started to run across the street. The neighbors were screaming. 
and uh, I ran down to their, their lower driveway where I could put the ladder up. And knowing the house, having been in the house, I knew that the only exit was on fire. They didn't have a deck or anything off the back of the house. And I saw that their big front glass window was open. Thankfully, that window was open and I was able to put the ladder up to it and get in without much um, resistance. I was standing there on the, the ladder and it was honestly a lot of smoke and a lot of flames coming out of that house. Punched in the screen window and um, looked inside and it was smoke pretty much all the way to the floor. And I thought to myself, wow, like I'm really about to go in there and turned around to whoever was there um, outside the house. And I said, you're sure they're in there, right? Cause I'm about to climb into this burning house. Yeah, that's what I was telling your dad most of the time too. I said, assure him they are in there. We have them on the phone still. So that was another thing is I know your dad was a little hesitant as any father would be to watch his son go into a burning house. Yeah, I can't imagine it from my dad's point of view, but that was the last thing on my mind at that point. It was punched the screen in and crawled into the house. Thankfully, I was wearing a ski hoodie and I was able to pull the, the shirt up over my face and kind of pull it tight and crawled along the floor. But with all the smoke and a fire burning around me, it was a little disorienting. Absolutely. But I was able to kind of shuffle my way along the floor back to the back bedroom and pounded a few times and kind of gave it one good thud. And with that, they opened the door and um, the mother, the grandmother, the infant, and the dog were all in the room and they, um, the grandmother was about to pass out. She said if we wouldn't have gotten in a little, little bit later, it would have been a um, different story. Took the young mother out first, the 23-year-old girl, Tessa, and kind of grabbed her and threw my arm around her and guided her along the floor out to the ladder and got her on the ladder kind of crawled along back through the back bedroom again and um, got little little baby Emma out, 11 months old, and um, ran back through the floor trying to cover her up as much as I could and got her to Tessa. And that was a, a pretty big challenge to give her the kid and try to help her climb down the ladder. Oh, she was still at the top of the and, ladder at that point. Yeah, this is a, an extended ladder, you know, 20 feet up in the air. And I kind of told her, look, you're, you're climbing down this ladder right now, and this is, this is how we're gonna do it. And I climbed back up inside and ran back in and grabbed her grandmother and brought the grandmother out, at which point I was just about ready to pass out. <laughs> a lot of smoke and just sense a delusion. I do remember when I got you on the phone at the end of it to make sure everybody was out, you were coughing pretty hard, and yep. you, you could definitely tell you could took in some smoke at that point. And at that point, I had all three humans out, out of the house and they were screaming about the dog and I went back in one more time for the dog yeah. and the dog was kind of a little bit to wrangle and yeah, sure. snapping at me and I got the dog by the, the harness and carried the dog out at which point I was like, all right, this is it. I was able to get out and kind of looked around and I was like, holy smokes, this, this actually just happened. Yeah. And then the fire company showed up and I, I think it would have been too late if, yeah. if and That's what I told your dad, because I think at one point he said, you know, no, the fire department's gonna be there before I can do anything. I said, you, I, unfortunately, you don't know that. I need you to try to do something because if not, these people could not end up well. I, I need you to get a ladder over there at this point, at least try until they get there. If you take the ladder for no reason, you take it for no reason, at least we gotta try. And yeah. here and there was a baby inside, I think. I mean, I have three children at home. I think any parent or anybody, when you hear there's a kid involved, it kind of heightens you a bit. It kind of brings things to a new level. It seriously was the 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 best teamwork that I've ever seen in my whole life, to Absolutely. be honest. And it was 100% a team effort between you and your father and everybody in our room at the same time to get those people out, just you know, based on what we were hearing and seeing from what we were being told from your father. I definitely think that was one of the, and probably will always be one of the most life-changing and humbling calls I will ever have and ever have taken um, and it's oh with me it's okay being a call I never have to take again um, it's what the one of those one in a million calls that you don't want to have to take again but you're glad the outcome came the way it did but the outcome was the way it was because of you you being there 110 percent is the reason that family is alive today 100 percent and you should be very humble about that you are the reason that family is alive today thank you appreciate it our second Spirit of Courage Award shows how, even with outstanding teamwork and perseverance, the results can be tragic, but it is the effort we applaud. Without question, that's the 
hardest call of my career so far, uh, and I hope of my career ever. Um, and it seems like it's a call that's never really going to be in the past. I think almost everybody who responded that night uh, was at home fast asleep. Uh, it was raining, it was a very cold, kind of miserable, foggy night. The 911 dispatchers actually had um, the girls on the phone and were, were giving us updates the whole time, which was one of the worst parts of, uh, uh, of the, the whole call, I think. Yeah. As I'm driving down, I get a call from one of my firefighters who lives down the street and um, basically just telling me there's heavy fire. They, it's a very serious call. It, it happened so fast that it's hard to like slow it down. I think the three of us went to the back of the house first because that's where I met up with you guys to try and gain entry on the backside. The girl's father was there um, and they they were trying to get an uh, understanding of where in the house the girls were. He kept saying the second floor and I kept looking up and you see the roof and you're like, there's, there's no second floor. There was fire blowing out every window and every door. There was yeah. heavy smoke. I remember pulling to the back of your engine and only seeing that 35 foot ladder and I it just heart sank a little bit because I know how big and heavy those are. I found uh, another exterior firefighter and she helped. And we got it up and we went to the roof and I'm all I feel is asphalt. I don't feel any windows, I don't feel anything else. Um, we kind of crawled towards the center and, and just all of a sudden I kind of got a wisp of a window. And as I went in uh, the window, I, I felt something that went over it and uh, ended up being the youngest girl. I grabbed her, I drug her um, kind of away towards the roof, towards the ladder. You know, she obviously didn't have a pulse and, and wasn't breathing. Um, so I started CPR. After we got her to the bottom of the roof, near the roof ladders, um, Chris had started making entry for to get to the second child. And I went back up and I started going in when he had the second one and him and I worked together to get her out. Just inside the window, I, I get oriented, start a search and just immediately find um, the girl just a couple feet inside the window and uh, passed her over my head out the window to Eric. I remember grabbing her by the hand and, um, you know, dragging her across the roof uh, to kind of get to a little bit safer spot, which, you know, those, uh, you know, the, the idea of, you know, pulling lifeless children across across the roof to safety is, um, is still one that was not, is not, is not easy. What what became hard for me is after we got down, kind of calmed down a little bit, we're sitting in the rehab area. Um, we got word back from the hospital that the valiant efforts of the MS crew and the hospital staff yeah. um, at the trauma center had gotten return of circulation. Essentially, they had gotten, um, they, 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 were, they, they had a pulse again. They were still obviously uh, in um, an extreme situation. And then we did receive word back that um, despite the valiant efforts by by everybody involved that the injuries were too severe and that they they had both died of yeah in in hindsight I, I want to give a some credit to a lot of credit actually to the guys who were inside on the hose line because um, when you look back at it we were on top of a lot of fire like the yeah, seat of yeah. the fire was directly underneath us on that roof correct yeah. so the fact that they were down there applying water um, kept us alive, kept us able to do the job that we did. In emergency services, we've been much more, we've talked a lot more about mental health now, mm -hmm. um, and everybody yeah. realizes it's okay not to be okay. We've gone back and forth numerous times talking about what could we've done differently, and the amount of debriefing we've done, it's, I think this was definitely the hardest call I've ever been on, but it's, difficult to process something like this. At the time, I was fine. After, the days after, and Brian knows because I talked to him nonstop after, it was it was definitely a rough time. This was absolutely the, the toughest call in my career. Yeah. Like, like Scott, um, you know, I've been in EMS since 2000, done a lot of different things in my career. Fate, you know, death is not something um, that is new to me by any stretch, um, but this this call uh, impacted me for yeah. sure in a way uh, that others didn't. Um, we've talked about this before. It sort of inspired us all to to go to the next level with what we're doing and train harder and just be ready for for anything at any time. Um, so 
in some ways it's been beneficial to us. You know, it, it drives crew, it drives training. Um, we all wish it hadn't ever happened, but um, we try to make the best of it by letting it improve us in, in the long term. With the help of generous donors and sponsors, Burn Prevention Network is proud to provide the Valley Preferred Spirit of Courage Awards, now in the 17th year, along with Burn Prevention and Support Services. Burn Prevention Network provides education and prevention materials to educators, healthcare providers, and the public to protect those most vulnerable to a burn injury. These efforts reach half a million people and 600 elementary and middle schools every year. On October 18th, we presented a Partners in Prevention Award to Dan Dillard, who recently retired after more than 35 years as executive director of this organization. Dan has been a tireless advocate for burn safety and has helped save countless people from a burn injury. You can view his story on the Burn Prevention Network website. A hallmark of our services is Camp Susquehanna, a summer camp for young burn survivors. Camp Susquehanna is a magical place where kids can just be kids. Besides providing typical summertime fun, camp helps increase their resiliency and connections to peers. Here is Camp Susquehanna in action. It's not like you think it's going to be like scary or stuff like that, but it's actually once you get there, you realize how fun it is and like all of the stuff you're worrying about, it'll all get taken care of by like the counselors or stuff like that. And you're safe out at all times too. The reason why I keep coming back is because if I don't come back, I won't be able to see my friends and my camp family. I love it because you can just be yourself. You don't have to worry about your burns or your, like my face. It's, you don't have to worry about it because no one will judge you at all. All of the things that they do relate to their life skills. So we want them to have fun. We want them to do things and expand, have maybe expand their experiences and do things that they've never done before. Um, and they can do these in a safe environment where they know they're supported, where they know if they don't do it, where they make a mistake, it's okay. And through that, we hope that they increase their self-esteem, that they feel good about themselves, that they manage those challenges, um, that they say to themselves, look what I did, I can do it. Our final award was presented to a burn survivor who is no stranger to adversity. The Walter J. Okunski Phoenix Award recipient is Chris Cadella. And like the mythical Phoenix bird, this award symbolizes new life after fire. It is a reminder that even in catastrophic suffering, there is an opportunity to flourish. It takes a special kind of courage to emerge from a burn injury. Determined to never take anything for granted, Chris has fought hard to rebuild his life and his family. He has remained optimistic, motivated, hopeful, and engaging with others, even when he felt broken. He and his family have given back to not only the Byrne community, but to many others in need. He has even become a volunteer with his local fire department. I remember it being a, a beautiful day. Uh, and I was spending most of my time working outside around the house. We had the windows open, it was just gorgeous. And, uh, you know, I remember we smelled propane. Let me just go inside and see. It was a faint smell, it wasn't anything strong from what I recall. I had no sense that there was a real danger. Um, so I went inside the house and, and uh, I went into the basement. I remember smelling an overwhelming uh, smell of propane and feeling a little frightened by that. And it just, it happened so fast. I remember see, looking up, hearing a noise, like an ignition. And then I remember seeing a fireball on the opposite wall of the basement go from like left to right. And just being very confused and then immediately sensing a ton of heat. And this happens in, in I'm guessing in milliseconds, but you, you, you 
you feel like, okay, well, it'll subside. Like sometimes when you get too close to an oven or a grill and you just feel like, okay, well, it's hot. It'll, it'll go away, but it didn't, it, it got worse. And at one point I realized I was melting. So at that point, I obviously turned to run. Um, and as fast as I could through the hallway, I remember the funny thing is I don't recall hearing an explosion. Uh, and everybody outside said the explosion was so loud and they could feel it for miles. I never heard an explosion. I heard the initial ignition of a flame, like a grill. And I, I ran down the hall and I remember behind me, I, in my peripheral vision, I saw a door explode. Um, and I just kept going towards the, the screen door, the front door. The first thing I did was run to the grass and, and roll. And then I settled down the grass. I did hear uh, my father-in-law say, you're not on fire. Uh, so I settled there and I realized the injuries were very, very severe. After I was still for a second, then it hit me like, where's my son? And I remember how terrified I was. Uh, and I just yelled, where's my son? Where's my son? Where's Brody? And I looked over to the left where I saw Megan on the grass away from the house, kneeling and holding my son. And then I was like, thank God, you know? And, uh, and then I put my head down and I just waited. Um, I don't know at what point I heard sirens. Uh, I, did, I was told that at some point that an ambulance was gonna come, have to come pick me up to take me to the, the helicopter be airlifted. And then I remember uh, inside the ER shouting everywhere, but there were people coming to me immediately. They started cutting off my clothes. So um, we hopped in the car and I made it three quarters of the way to the hospital and I called because I didn't really know where I was supposed to see him yeah. and go find out where he was and they told me that I had to turn around because I couldn't come. Because of COVID, no one else was, no one was allowed in. Which was really hard. So I got a chance to talk to Chris for probably less than a minute when the hospital called me back and um, talked to some of the people in the ER and, you know, they handed him the phone and basically asked me if I could, you know, approve having him, what I guess I didn't realize was put into a coma. And intubated, yeah. And I had to approve that, yeah. And so they said that his throat was closing up and that I needed to give approval immediately. I didn't realize it would be about 60 days until we got to talk to him or see him. Um, you know, I found out later that I got some serious infections. Uh, my heart rate was off the charts, and they, they were worried that I might go into cardiac arrest. They had a hard time controlling that. Um, some other things, I, got, I think I well, got sepsis. Uh, there were just a staff. What I learned, yeah, Lots is that of different things. some so, things are almost inevitable. I was so glad for a number of reasons that, that it happened to me and that no one, no one else besides our dogs were in that house. But also that I think if it was me who had to keep it together, take care of our son, make sure you, you protected him and you know, uh, from what was going on, having to manage everyone else in the family, wondering what was happening. I, I cannot imagine that amount of stress and I don't think I have the strength that you have to do that. I think I would have broken completely. Um, for me, I think being in the coma was the easy part. You never forget the people who were there to, to help you through that. And, and Alicia meant so much to me, as did just about all the staff that I came into contact with. So I felt just a, a desire to want to give some of that back to do that, for to be there. I remember it, it took you a little time before you felt ready to do that, but one of the things right off the bat I noticed, you're always wonderful about sharing and being open and honest and vulnerable, but also wanting to make sure you're checking in with other people and that, you know, that they are part of the conversation, that you get a chance to connect with them. That was something I was interested in doing and I think it would be really meaningful after everything that happened and how so many people were there for me. I'm glad for the opportunity. It's given me a sense of purpose too, and a sense of fulfillment that I don't think I had before this. You know, really, really to heal and just to figure out my life going forward. We've done the Christmas groups and things yes. too, and uh, it's nice to see like the full families right. too, which is kind of cool and seeing other people's kids. And... So to be involved and in yeah. what gives you a sense of community with other people who are experiencing similar things is really comforting, you know, and it gives you strength and courage. It gives you a, a wider sense of family and, and support that's, you know, invaluable. It's hard to, it's hard to quantify how much it's, I've benefited from that. 
I feel so grateful, number one, just to be alive. And, I, and for sure there were things before this that I took for granted. Like, I didn't need this to, to figure out that I loved my wife and my son. But now I know how crucial just being in their presence every single day is. Uh, and I definitely took that for granted at times before. The most important thing is when I, when I was in the hospital and I just so desperately wanted to get home to my family and it wasn't even a decision. It was just like, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to get out of this bed. And it was, so it wasn't even a decision. They asked me to do 10 reps of this or this exercise, I was gonna do 20. I was gonna do whatever it took to get out of there and get home. And I realized that how incredibly lucky I am to have a purpose. I don't think I would have wanted to get up out of that bed if I didn't have a reason to. So that's why she and my son, they're the heroes. Alicia is the hero. They gave me a reason to want to get up and live. And it's amazing to me that somebody cared enough to give me these beautiful people in my life. The Valley Preferred Spirit of Courage Awards are about selflessness, sacrifice, and overcoming insurmountable odds. They are about the heroes we celebrate tonight and the ones we are all capable of becoming. Good night, and please stay safe. I learned firsthand what the survivors of a burn injury go through and I climbed back up inside and ran back in and grabbed her grandmother. The fact that they were down there applying water um, kept us alive, kept us able to do the job that we did. Reports came in that there was a, a possible entrapment on a male on the second floor. Engine one drove into the smoke and they disappeared and they were only like three truck lengths ahead of us. That's how thick the smoke was. When I opened the storm door, it was zero visibility. Smoke was all the way to the floor. I would do it time and time again if I had to. And that made me feel good that maybe I can impact one life. There was uh, two doors, one on the left he took, and then I uh, took another door. Whether it's your house on fire or we're pumping out your basement during the storm, we come out and we help whatever way we can. Flames started coming through the back of the house at that point in time. I think it registered with us that it was pretty serious. And I just so desperately wanted to get home to my family. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get out of this bed. <laughs>